Let's get back to the symbolic. The Bayahu, the acceptance of a primordial signifier. This primordial signifier signifies nothing except the existence of signification, the fact that language exists. You don't know what the word means. It doesn't carry meaning. All it tells you is that there is a world of words surrounding you. Now, surrounding you is important here because part of what you accept when you accept the primitive signifier is you accept that there is a structuring force known as language, the symbolic, society, law, that is not of your own creation, but into which you must fit. And I say must here very carefully because it feels like a commandment. You can either start using your words, the parent or primary caregiver would tell the child, or you can not get what you want. So the child wants something, doesn't get it, starts crying. And the parent says, I don't understand you when you're crying. I can't help you when you're crying. Take a deep breath, use your words, and tell me what you want. The child starts to hear these things over and over again and has come to the conclusion that unless I use this damn foreign language, I'm not going to get what I want. And whenever I do use the language, whenever I do play by the rules, I get rewarded. So think potty training. Initially, the child just poops and pees whenever and wherever they feel like it. Potty training comes about when the primary caregiver or somebody else starts to tell the kid, hey, there's an appropriate time to do that and an appropriate place to do that. And the kid is like, initially, I mean, who wouldn't? I mean, would be like, I'm not going to do that. Try teaching that to your dog. They kind of know it. But ultimately, they know that when they're outside, they can poop or pee just about anywhere. And if something needs to happen, you'll take care of it. If they poop, no matter where, on the sidewalk, on the grass, wherever, you're going to pick it up. Now, some dogs can be even more better, better trained than that and all this kind of stuff. But for the most part, potty training is about accepting that there are proper and improper places to go to the bathroom. That is primarily what the neurotic subject accepts. They accept that there is a world that has rules in it a language that has words that must be used in a particular way in order to get what they want. Earlier on in this seminar, Lacan talks about this in terms of full speech. You are my husband, which in turn positions you and me into some sort of a relationship. The first and foremost function of language, of the symbolic for Lacan, is as a positioning agent. It's a structure into which the person who accepts its existence is positioned. That remains throughout this seminar and throughout Lacan's work on the symbolic. The symbolic is always first and foremost a positioning structure. It puts you in your place. Which brings us to another element of this primitive signification, this acceptance of the primordial signifier that the psychotic rejects. To be put in one's place, to allow the symbolic to put you in your place, to help position you in the world as, for instance, a little boy or a little girl. Think about it. You're born, you're brought home, and the primary caregivers have already painted your room pink. They've already purchased a bunch of dresses for you. They're already trying to fit you into a world. That's real. That's the symbolic at work. Notice, even before they met you, even before you were born, before you had even entered the world as an independent being, the world was ready to receive you, ready with your place ready to put you in your place. That's this symbolic enterprise. The reason why the psychotic person is kind of cuckoo is because they've never been put in their place. They've rejected the structure that would have helped them find their place, find their position, a position that helps them make sense of their world. Like it or not, being positioned or placed as a little girl it brings with it a whole narrative that you can accept and allow it to structure your life. You can reject and still allow it to structure your life. 
but it brings with it a narrative, a coherence. It puts you in your place, contains you, gives you a sense of stability, structure, ballast. That's the fundamental role of the symbolic. First and foremost is its structuring. It helps you find your place in the world. But remember, I put it differently. It puts you in your place. No matter what the first word you heard was, it was always the same word. And this is where things are going to get tricky. That word was no. No in the sense of thou shalt not. Because in order to accept the symbolic as a structuring force, a force that gives you identity and helps shape the meaning of your life, you have to first experience it as a constraint, as a prohibition. What does it prohibit? Very simply, the symbolic prohibits life without the symbolic. That is what you encounter first and foremost. The first word is always no, thou shalt not. Thou shalt not what? Thou shalt not continue living as though there's no symbolic. This is tricky. The first word is no. It is a prohibition. And it is a prohibition against living life as though there were no words. So when the child starts their life as a subject of pure need, they experience something amiss and they cry. And ideally, a primary caregiver shows up and helps like resolve the matter. As time goes on, we know that primary caregivers start telling their children, you need to start using words. I don't understand you when you cry. And the child learns to take their needs and mediate them through language. In other words, to transform their needs into demands. Now, that is an enabling technique because by doing this, the child is able to get what they want, to get their needs met by using language. It allows them to get something done. But notice this. It is also an acceptance of prohibition, of castration, an acceptance that they can't do it any other way anymore, that it's not okay for them to cry and expect to get what they want. So you can see this in children who have a really hard time with potty training sometimes up into their teenage years, where they will get really excited or really stressed out and they'll accidentally poop their pants. Accidentally. They act out in these very interesting ways, troubling ways. It shows them bumping up against the basic prohibition that the symbolic brings with it. The first word is no, thou shalt not. And what it says is, thou shalt not continue pooping your pants whenever you want. So it's a big deal when you do that. Past the point at which you have otherwise accepted castration. Accepted that you have to use this foreign language, this foreign tool in order to get what you want. Castration, prohibition, no. These are all fundamental constraints. It feels like you have to give something up in order to get something on the back end. In order to get what you want in a world of language, you have to give up on trying to get what you want without words. You have to give up on the world you presumably had before. I say presumably because it's only in a world of language that we have enough meaning in place for us to make sense of something like a lost world of pure need. The Garden of Eden doesn't exist. It never existed by this logic. It's only when Adam and Eve have been ejected from the Garden of Eden that anything like the Garden of Eden emerges as a fantasy, as a lost paradise. Paradise never exists except as lost. It's always gone in this regard. The kind of Edenic wholeness and bliss that we presume the baby has, that Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden, that only exists in hindsight, retrospectively, 
We presume its existence by the fact that we live in a world that's not like that. We don't live in Eden, which is how we can keep dreaming about it. Now you're starting to think like a Lacanian. This is how Lacan thinks here. So the symbolic is first and foremost a positioning agent, a structure that puts you in your place. But in putting you in your place, that it also forces you to give up something. It forces you to accept as the primordial signifier, no. That's why when Lacan says, what does the primordial signifier signify? What does it mean? It means nothing. On the one hand, what he's saying is that it has no meaning because all it points to is a world of meaning into which you're supposed to fit. On the other hand, what he's saying is when he says it means nothing, that it signifies nothing, is that it points to the fundamental no thing, the thing that is made out of the signifier no, the thing known as prohibition, the thou shalt not. That is the no thing, N O dash T-H-I-N-G. That is implicit whenever he uses the word nothing. Nothing is always also a no thing. So first and foremost, though, we have symbolic as positioning. It puts you in your place. But that putting in your place is also functioning as a prohibition of sorts because it now prohibits you from ever being out of place. That now becomes a source of tension. Are you in your place or are you out of place? This is all throughout the book. I'll just call your attention almost at random to a passage on page 179, about middle of the page. The symbolic provides a form into which the subject is inserted at the level of his being. It's on the basis of the signifier that the subject recognizes himself as being this or that, girl or boy. The chain of signifiers has a fundamental explanatory value. The very notion of causality is nothing else. So the symbolic is a form. It's a great way to start thinking about this and a term that's going to come up for him again and again because it's fundamentally empty, as we'll see. It's a form into which the subject is inserted. And the signifiers that the subject encounters when they're inserted into this form allow the subject to recognize themselves as being this or that. Even this book, even this passage, even this sentence, it's on the basis of the signifier that the subject recognizes himself as being this or that. Oh, I see. So even just in reading this passage, Lacan has used not themselves, but himself. This is a gendered sentence. And it presumes and positions you as someone who responds to the him, he, his, phenomenal construction. Notice that. All language is always doing the same thing. It is putting you in your place. The chain of signifiers in which the subject recognizes themselves as a himself or a herself doesn't have to be words. It can be the color of the paint on the wall in your bedroom. It can be the fabrics and the clothings that are in the dresser drawer of the bedroom. These are all signifiers that help you recognize yourself as being this or that, a boy or a girl. This is the first and foremost rule of the symbolic. It puts you in your place. But in so doing, it also tells you, you are in this place, which means you can't be in that one. Your room is painted pink, so it's messed up that you want to dress like a boy. In other words, it brings with it not just containment and structure and security. It also brings with it prohibition, constraint, alienation. It puts you in your place, but what if that place doesn't feel like it's yours? We'll pause there and continue in a minute.